In this chapter, we're going to be talking about how you can report your data results, and we'll really be focusing on visualization this round. Uh, I want to start with a few plot guidelines, and then this video will also set up the example data that we'll use in the rest of the video lectures for this week. So I want, we've, we've talked a little bit about ggplot, we've talked about the basics of creating those visualizations. Now I want to introduce you to more and more of the things that you can do with ggplot, but I want to do it in a framework of thinking about what makes a plot or a visualization good. So I'm going to go through a few, and for each of those I'll use that as a chance to introduce you to how to do more stuff with ggplot, the mechanics of it. But I, I've pulled these from some good resources. There are some wonderful books about how to make good and effective visualizations. Some of my favorite authors on this are Edward Tufte, Howard Weiner, Stephen Few, and Nathan Yao. They've all written really wonderful books. And in particular, I think that the book The Visual Display of Quantitative Information by Edward Tufte is, is almost a must read if you're a graduate student. Um, it, it, I think it lays out a lot of the principles that are used for making really good graphics today. So as I mentioned, we'll kind of focus the lectures this week around some guidelines for good graphics. And then within that framework, I'll show you how to do more stuff with ggplot. We'll focus on six guidelines. And we've got slides and small videos to go through each, but these are to aim for high data density, use labels that are clear and meaningful, provide references that are useful, to highlight interesting aspects of your data, make order meaningful, and then when it's possible and reasonable to use small multiples. So in the next set of videos for this chapter, we'll go through each of these and we'll talk about what they mean and how to do them. For all of the stuff that we'll be doing, we're going to use dplyr to help us clean up the data a little bit, but then we're going to use several different um, packages for working with the visualizations. ggplot2 is certainly one, but we'll also be using ggthemes for more of what are called themes. And then I also in the slides so some examples of using a package called grid extra to place ggplot um, uh, plots next to each other in an output. I won't do that in, as much in RStudio because I don't need to, but for the slides for some of the comparisons I'm doing that. And I think that that is a really helpful package to know, to know that you can do that. So I would suggest that you install that as well. For our data, one of the ones that we'll use, we've been using a lot in the in-class exercises. That's the World Cup data set from Faraway. So again, if you'd like to load that, we can go into RStudio. And I'll do this in a, in a script. So you'll need to make sure that you, um, you have installed the Faraway package if you haven't already. And then the data set again, again for that is named World Cup. Let me make sure that I load some of these other libraries too. So I'll do um, dplyr. And then let's do ggplot2. I'll have to make sure some of these others I have on this computer. It's kind of a new computer. Nope, I don't have that yet. So let me install that. And then the last one is grid extra. I'll run fine. So let's take a look to remind you what World Cup looks like. And again, I'll just pipe that into head so we can see the first few rows of it. So this is a data frame where we have data from the 2010 World Cup um, uh, in, in soccer or football as, as it's known in most of the world. So we've got different teams. Each of the rows is a player who played in that World Cup. And going across the different fields that we have in the columns are the team that that person played for, what position he played, the amount of time that he played in the World Cup, number of shots, passes, tackles, and saves. The other data set that we'll be using is from a data set called Nmaps, and it's one that's very dear to my heart because I used it a whole lot in my dissertation research, and I continue to use it for some of my research. Uh, piece of it, the data for Chicago, is in the DLNM 
package. And this is a wonderful package for fitting something called distributed lag nonlinear models, which are very popular in a lot of environmental epidemiology, a lot of things where we explore the relationship between ambient exposures like air pollution or temperature and human health outcomes at the community level. So you'll need to make sure that you have the DLNM package. Actually, I can go down here to do that. This is another one that I might need to install here, DLNM. Oh, I misspelled it anyway. All right, yeah. So I'll install that. Once you have it installed, there is a data set in it called Chicago and Maps. So let's load that and take a look at it. So here we have different rows for dates, and it goes from 1987, I believe, to 2000. On each row, we have the date. And then we have some columns where it's broken up those date elements. Of course, we can do that with Luber dates, so we wouldn't necessarily need to have all of these elements, but they've done it here for some of their statistical modeling. So time is the day in the full data series. So it goes from one to the number of rows that exist in the full data set. Here we've got year, month, and day of year. So that's pulling out elements from the date, the year and the month. And then the day of year starts at 1 on January 1st, and then it goes all the way to 365 on December 31st, unless it's a leap year. Day of week is also pulling out that weekday element. And then we have a few health outcomes. The number of deaths in Chicago on that date, the number of specifically deaths from cardiovascular causes and deaths from respiratory causes. And then next, we have some elements that are associated with the ambient conditions in the city that day. And a lot of these for the weather ones are from ground-based stations. And then the ones for, um, for the different air pollutants are from air pollution monitoring stations that are set up in the city. So we have temperature, dew point temperature, and I believe the difference in these two, I believe the temperature set up in Celsius, but dew point temperature is in Fahrenheit. Um, we've also got relative humidity. And then we've got a measure right here of particulate matter on the, in the city and every day. And that was not measured every single day. I think I believe that's why we've got some missing values here. And then we've got a measure of ozone in the city. Let's do just a few things to change this. So one of the things that I've studied in my scientific work is the health impacts of heat waves. And there was a very severe heat wave in Chicago in 1995. That's covered in the data we have here. So we'll use that as an example as we're doing some of our visualizations. So the first thing I want to do here, this is kind of a long and ungainly name, and you'll notice that we've got this mix of lowercase and uppercase. It's going to be a little bit of a pain to type. So let's rename the whole object. And then the next thing, I want to create an object from this that is pulling out just things for July of 1995. So we'll take, let's set up the, the data frame for that first, and then we'll assign it its own name. So if we take Chicago and then pipe it in, in this case, we want to take from a lot of rows, all of these dates from 1987 to 2000, and we want to pull out just a small subset of those rows based on some, some logic. So we're going to use filter for that. That's the natural function to use for it. So we'll filter it, and the logic we want to do here, we'll take advantage of some of the columns that are already in there. Uh, if we didn't have these columns, we could certainly get this information from date, but since they're already in there, it'll save us just a little bit of typing. So the first thing is I want where the year was in 1995, and we can take a look just at this part and make sure that's looking okay. Well, maybe let me pipe that into head while we're checking it too so we don't get loads of stuff. All right, this looks great. So now we're starting on January 1st of 1995 instead of later. Then the next thing that we want to do is we want to make sure that we pick out just when it was July. So we have the months here based on a number, so like one for January and two for February. So if we set month equals seven, that should be July. So let's run that and double check it. The other thing I guess to point out here 
is in this case we've actually got two logical expressions, the one checking if the year is equal to 1995 and if the month is equal to 7. And then we've joined them together to form a larger logical expression using that ampersand logical operator. And so this is saying to filter only to the rows that meet both of these conditions, that the year is 1995 and the month is, is uh, July. So we can run that, and this looks great. So we're starting in July 1st of 1995. All right, this is exactly what we want now. We can take off that head because we were using that just to check. And then let's name this Chic July. All right, so once you have that set up, you'll be ready to go with doing the example code in the rest of the slides for this chapter.